One of the most frightening things that I can think of in the world is for a person to be unconcerned about their soul. It's a terrible thing for a person to have no concern about their soul. They are unmoved by whatever God does. And I pray that this day that someone or some ones, some of you, will have an experience with Christ that you've never had before. Maybe the only experience uh, that you've ever had. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke, the very first chapter. I want you to go with me to the 30th verse, the first chapter of Luke. Then the angel said to her, this is Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be? since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be the born will be called the Son of God. And I want you to go just on down because I'm not going to read the next one. The 37th verse, For with God nothing will be impossible. For with God nothing shall be impossible. You see, Mary is saying that this is not possible for me to have a child. There's no way that a child can be born from me because I am a virgin. I I have never been with a man. And the angel said, with God, nothing is impossible. And I'd like to have you to bow with me in prayer. Father, we praise and honor and worship you today. We thank you that with you nothing is impossible. We thank you that your power can come and even the very beginning, the making of the gospel was when your son was conceived into a virgin by the Holy Spirit. That that is the most impossible thing we can imagine. But with you, it's not impossible. All things are possible to those that believe. Today I pray that your Holy Spirit would come again and and make us see the impossible and how that we can be born again. It's, It's not in the man's nature to understand, but we believe that you come to save us. Now we're asking you to do that this day and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The... There are so many things that is so wonderful and so outstanding about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we so many times think 
that all of the great things have happened a while back, hundreds of years ago. Eric this morning taught on the Holy Spirit. There's so many people today that say it's not for us. It's a cop-out. It's laziness. I want to be this way because I don't want to press into God. I want to be, I want to just believe in my own little, uh, I, I, I want a little fire insurance. I want to try to get out of, the, out of hell, but I sure don't want to uh, do anything more than what I absolutely have to to stay out. Well, friend, I want to tell you something. That's a terribly dangerous approach to take. We need to say, God, whatever you got, I want. And I want to know the wonders the wonder of the gospel. I want the gospel of Jesus Christ to be something in me. All through the, the time of, of the uh, birth of Jesus, we find wonderful things happen. But again, I'm going to ask you, what has the gospel meant to you? What does Christmas, for instance, mean to you? I remember, friend, when to me, the most depressing time of the year was Christmas. It really was. Has anybody else ever experienced that? I, I, I tell you, I hated those Christmas carols. I, I really, I just, I really did. I, I, I didn't like the things of Christmas. It was so, that was a period of time when it seemed like nothing was going on. It was just kind of a whole hum time. You know why? because I didn't know the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I didn't know what it, what, what it stood for. And I, I, the flesh, uh, the, the, when you talk about the gospel to the flesh, it's a terrible, draggy, terrible down, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a downer, if you will. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ or can only mean something to you when you have a desire to know him and you have a hunger for him and you want him, that is when the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, uh, has made. I want to ask you, how much difference is there in your life uh, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ? So many times, uh, you know, people uh, say this and I, I have this uh, said to me continually that uh, when, when I ask the people, when was you saved? And when a person says, oh, I've been saved all of my life, I know right then they've never really had an encounter with Jesus Christ. I, 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 you know, I was, they, they, know the, they know exactly when they was baptized. They, they said, oh, yeah, I was baptized. The baptism is the big thing in the majority of people's life. No, friend, the baptism means very little. There's going to be millions of people that's going to go to heaven that's never been baptized. And there's going to be millions of people that's not going to go to heaven that have been baptized. I want you to understand, it's about the blood of Jesus. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about the coming uh, uh, and, and, and the vision of him and you seeing him hanging on a cross, dying, uh, for the lost world. It's when those things begin to mean something to you, the blood and, and the power of God to redeem and to bring us. I, I, I want you to know there's so many people that have no idea what it means uh, that when, when we say, uh, you know, that, and when Jesus said that you must drink uh, uh, of my blood and you must eat of my flesh, uh, how many people have any understanding about that? As a matter of fact, it was that very t thing that caused some great problems. Uh, I want you to understand how much time do you spend in your life of thinking about the gospel? How much time, what is your great motivation? You know, it's our job to try to help people. It's our job to try to encourage people. It's our job when... When people come to Heartland, that they uh, uh, that that we try to help them learn how to work, because we believe that's a great important facet. That's an important factor. That the reason that so many people have been so messed up in their life, they they don't know how to work. 
They hate work. They don't want to work. It's our job to teach uh, our young people how to conduct themselves. It's our job to teach uh, people how to eat. It's uh, and, and not to uh, uh, think that they've, you know, so many people have spent their life uh, as, a, as the prodigal son in the, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, hog pen that, that they act a whole lot like them. We, we, it's our job to try to ta- help people to change their life. It's about, a, it's about etiquette. It's about, uh, it, it's about respect. It, it's about the decency. It's about a lot of things. But friend, all of those things or none of those things will take you to heaven. Uh, the only thing that will take you to heaven is the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. And, and, and that's why he died. If it wasn't for the death of Christ, my friend, we have, would have no hope. And a lot of people's trying to get to heaven without giving that any consideration. They just want to say, you know, the gospel. Yeah, oh yeah, I kind of like to hear it. I, I, I like to, I have people to say to me on a fairly regular basis, Oh yeah, we like the directness. Now I have some people that says something different than that too. Uh, but but I have people to say we like the directness. We like for you to tell it like it is. But but yet, friend, if I do that from now on and it does not move you to salvation, it does not move you to the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that you want to do what He wants you to do, then all this preaching and all of the teaching and all of the things that we possibly uh, can listen to or hear, it's not going to mean anything to you because on that day when you stand before God and you do not know His Son Jesus, my friend, He's going to say, depart from me ye workers of iniquity into outer darkness, be cast out where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing teeth. These things are real. They're not, they're not some just something that somebody went wild one day and wrote in the Bible. This is not a novel, friend. This is not a book uh, to entertain. This is a book about life. He said, I put before you death and I put before you life. Choose life. And Jesus is the life. Jesus is the hope. Jesus is the only thing there is. Oh, God, help us today to see Jesus and know who he is. Is. God has done everything from the beginning of the Bible. It's not so much about the history of man. It's about history of God dealing with man. Man fell. He fell in sin. And God has spent all of the time trying to get man to come back to him. One day he spoke. I just want to show you some things about the gospel. The gospel really started in many respects or parts of the gospel. Actually before Jesus ever come. One day there was a man, he was a pagan. His name was Abraham. And God said, I want you to get up and leave this place. Get out of this country and go to a country which I will tell you. This man was a heathen. I want you to understand. But when God speaks to you as a heathen, He speaks in such a way you know. Now I want to tell you something. When this service ends today, the Word of God is going to be plain enough that the Holy Spirit is, going, is, 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 is real enough that I want you to know you're going to know this day, whether you're being called of God. You can't get saved unless you're called of God. You do know that. You you can't just say one day, I'm going to get up and get saved. No, friend, unless the Holy Spirit calls you, you cannot get saved. It's not one of those deals that's just something you say I'm going to do. The power of God's got to come upon you. The Holy Spirit's got to come upon you. And when He does, and He will today, I can tell you that. that but sooner or later we get to the place we can't even hear Him. We're so indifferent. We say, you know, I don't know of anything God's done for me. Well, I want to tell you, Abraham had never had God to do anything for him that he knew of at the time. He was a heathen. He was a pagan. But God said, get up and go. And he said, do what I tell you. And all Abraham had to do is obey. Friend, 
It's all been done. God has set the table. God has made the provision. God has said the banquet is ready. Come and dine. He said come and, and, and eat of me and drink of me. You don't have anything to do except to obey. You have to get up and you have to say I am going to make my start for God. And, and he's not going to do that. I'm going to He's not going to come into the seat and drag you by the nap of the neck out and stand you up here and say, now today you're going to get saved. He won't do that. But I'll tell you what he will do. He will gently come and tug at you. He will come and say, yes, come today. The gentle move of the Spirit of God, he will say, give me your heart this day. But one day, if you continue to rebel against him, one day if you say no, and often enough, the Holy Spirit, it's, he, the Holy Spirit begins to be a hurt. And the Holy Spirit begins to say, I'm going to back away, back away, back away till finally one day you will not hear the call of God on your life. The Bible says that the day will come. Or he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man. That I believe this that everybody ought to have the right to hear the gospel once before anybody has the right to hear it twice. And America has heard the revi heard about revival. America has heard about the gospel. America has heard about everything that's about the Bible for 200 years. And yes, we are so arrogant. We are so indifferent. We are so unconcerned. Friend, the day will come when God will judge you for that. The gospel. Abraham went and we see what happens, what God did after his obedience with Isaac and Jacob. There was a great nation founded. This was a little group of people Anybody that's foolish enough to believe that Israel become the great nation that it was without God's direct intervention has got to be literally out of their mind. I want to tell you something, friend. Anybody that would believe that you could be where you are today without the intervention of God you got to be out of your mind. God is trying to get you to open up to the gospel. He's trying to get you to understand that He loves you. He's trying to get you to understand that He gave the paid the, the supreme price for you. He's trying to get you to understand that He wants you. He is. He's paid, He's done it all. But so many people say, "What has God done for me?" The gospel seems to not move me. The gospel is something that. That I don't want to hear about. I, I, I want to say this. Why do you think America has become the nation that it is? It is because we honored in the beginning His Son Jesus. And we have done everything that we, or we did everything that we could to lift up the name of Jesus in the early part of this nation. And because of that, God said that he would, he would bless us even to a thousand generations if we would honor His Son. And God is blessing America not because of what America is doing today, but because of what our forefathers did and the people did in the past. My dear brother and sister, unless you and I turn back to Christ with all of our heart and all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength, there is no hope for America. I can tell you that. And that's what Heartland is all about, is to try to get people to understand it's about our young people. Unless we can turn our young people around and give them hope, and there is hope in Christ, this nation has no hope whatsoever. The, the, anyone that thinks that we have become great because of ourselves is ridiculous. It can't happen. Salvation is totally of God. I hear this all the time. Well, I'll get saved. God will save me when He's ready. Friend, He's been ready. He's been ready for 2,000 years. 
The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. He is, he is ready. People say, you know, I, I, want, I, want to be, uh, I, I want to be saved when God's ready. He'll, he'll, he'll do it whenever he's ready. Mary said to the angel, I want to say it again. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? I have had no man, so I can't have a child. And there's people that said, how do you get saved? I'd like to know how you get saved. I don't understand how you get saved. I don't understand what it's all about. And friend, you don't have to understand any part of it. All you have to do is to come to Jesus Christ and he will forgive you of your sin. You repent of your sin. You say, I'm going to live my life for him. It's not anymore about anything else. I want to go on just a minute. I want, but at the same time or just before, Jesus was born actually the same time there was another woman that was with child she was an older woman and it was her name was Elizabeth and she was having a child and his name was going to be called John John the Baptist and he began to preach the gospel. Now, it was impossible for this woman to have a child because she was past age. So many times these things has happened. Sarah, Abraham's wife, she was past age. She was 90 years old. I want to tell you, God is always doing some miraculous things. He has always, all through the Old Testament, and then coming into the New Testament, John was born of a, an elderly woman and he, he was, uh, he was, it was hum, not humanly possible. There wasn't any way. It was a great miracle. Now I want you to notice that, that uh, the only thing they could say when Jesus come, because I just spoke on this, but I want to mention it again. Uh, Jesus Christ, when he come, he was of the most humble uh, of circumstance. He was born in a manger. He had, a, he had an humble family that, that nobody, uh, they were poverty uh, stricken and all of that. And you know the only things they could say about Jesus in the beginning, uh, I want you to get this. Never a man spake like this man. When he began to speak, they begin to say such thing. Never, uh, we never saw it on this wise before. These are statements that people made about Jesus. He had power over wind and the sea. He had power over all manner of devils and diseases. He even commanded the grave to yield up the dead. His most astonishing feat of all was his resurrection. They said all kinds of things about him, but he did all kinds. But I want you to notice what the gospel does to some people what the gospel has a tendency to do I want you to if you're taking notes you don't have to turn if you don't want but I'm going to read this to you because the gospel friend when the gospel gets to you it begins to change you it begins to do things in you I want you to notice in Acts 3, 6 to 10. I'm going to read this because it's important. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I ha do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking, leaping, leaping and praising God. Friend, I want to tell you something. When the gospel of Jesus Christ comes on you, there's going to be a change in your life. It's, there's going to be something happen. You know, people want everything to be decently in order. I'm so sick and tired of, of people saying, you know, what we need to do. We need a little dignity in our, in our church. Yes, we do, friend. What we need, we need the power of God to set us free. And when the gospel of Jesus Christ hits you, there's going to be some walking, some leaping, and some praising God. 
God. You're going to forget all about anything. You're going to forget. Let me tell you something. If we can get stirred up about a game, we ought to be able to get stirred up about the gospel of Jesus Christ. The wonder of the gospel. The wonder of the gospel. I want you to, I, I, I like this and I like this and better than any, any of them. John 9, 23. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. Now this is the blind man. And they was questioning. You know when the power of God begins to fall, some people start getting skeptical. Some people start running. Some people says, I don't want any part of this. Some people have a terrible time in their lives because uh, when, when the gospel comes, the gospel will do one of two things to you. It will make you repent or it will make you curse God and your, at least your action. The gospel of Jesus Christ, when it comes, there's going to be one of two things happen. You're going to run to the cross or you're going to run away from it. Uh, but his parents, therefore, his parents said he is of age. Ask him. So they begin to call the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. You know, they've said Jesus is crazy. We talked about that a couple Sundays ago. Jesus is crazy. He's full of the devil. And now again, they're saying he's a sinner. And this man answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Hallelujah. Oh, praise his name. One time I couldn't see and now I can. Oh, let me tell you something, friend. When the gospel of Jesus Christ comes on you, it's going to change your life. There's not going to be any more saying, well, I don't, I'm having a miserable time serving God. I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do this and I can't do this. It's all I can't do. Oh, no, friend. When the gospel hits you, you're going to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am ready to die. I am ready to give it up. I'm ready to, I'm ready to give all of it up on the, uh, on the altar. I want just Jesus. It's not about not doing it. It's about I don't want to do it. I don't want to be like I used to be. I don't want to have those thoughts I used to have. Well, I don't know about, you can say what you want to about Jesus. But he had the gospel hit me and now I'm free. And now I'm in love with Him. Now I'm in love with love. Now I love people that I never did love before. Now I've got my eyes open. Now I've got my ears open. Now I want to respond to the power of God. Oh, listen, friend, I want to tell you something. Listen to this. Here's what happens when the gospel hits you. Most assuredly, I say to you, this is John 14, 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father when the gospel hits you. Friend, I want to tell you something. It will go all over you and it will go all in you and it'll give you a new heart and a new mind and a new way of walking. It'll give you a new way of thinking. It's supernatural. I want you to know everything about God is supernatural. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible.